Christmas at the hub. Oh, who is ready to give your all to Jesus this morning? Oh, he's so good. Come on, guys. He's worthy this morning. We're just going to give it all to Jesus. We're going to give all of our gaze, all of our focus. In no come let us adore him oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him Christ the Lord In no come let us adore him oh come let us adore him oh
And I'll praise cause you're sovereign yeah. Praise cause you reign Woo. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave I'll praise cause you're faithful Praise cause you're true Praise cause there's nobody greater than you Come on! I'll praise cause you're sovereign you Praise reign. cause you reign Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave I'll praise cause you're faithful you're Praise true. cause you're true Praise cause there's nobody so fun. Oh, who's having a good time this morning? Woo! If you're just getting here, Merry Christmas at the hop. We just want to, we just want to set our gaze on Jesus. There's nothing else that really matters. You know, we can try to hype up all these songs and we can, you know, celebrate and sing and dance but what we're really here for is just the presence of God this morning the presence of Jesus there's nothing that compares there's no song there's no feeling there's no there's nothing that compares to the presence of God it's what we're after this morning we're not after a we're not after a feeling we're not after a sense we're after a person we're after the person of Jesus this morning it's been so so good to us thank you Jesus
strong to say in your mighty name king of heaven come. Jesus we give you all the glory all the praise all the honor in Luke 2 when the Christmas story opens up in scripture and an angel appears before the shepherds right and I'm going to read this. It says, And suddenly there was an angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Right? Jesus came to bring peace between you and God, between humanity that was far from him, to come and remove that gap, that separation that allows us to come into the very presence and the knowing of a real and mighty God. And that peace, that good will towards man came in the form of a babe in a manger. That's Jesus Christ. And we celebrate that as we enter. This is Christmas Eve, right? We celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, we have a special, uh, a special from our kids' ministry. Uh, Natasha is going to bring in uh, one of our classrooms, and they're going to sing us a song. So let's, I want to get prepared for that. Uh, ben, can you help me? We're going to bring baby Jesus and put him right up front. real hay too. <laughs> Smells like barn. <laughs> All right. We're so proud of our kids uh, at the hop uh, and what they mean to us and what they mean to God. And they're going to come and share something they've been working on. So I'm going to invite Natasha to, to bring them in. So come on in. So we have been working for quite a few weeks on this piece, and I am so proud of these amazing kids. They are super nervous, but they're very excited to perform for you, and we are excited to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. So enjoy this with us. You can cue it. Children are going to do wonderful. It's the pastor that we need to be concerned with. <laughs>
King of nations, Lord of all, ruler of our days. God made flesh this babe so small, worthy of our praise. You guys can all take a bow if your halos won't fall off. <laughs> we are so proud of our kids' ministry, and we would just like to offer, we have a group here that wasn't performing with us. We'd love, would you guys like to come on the stage so we can pray for you? <laughs> so we have been having between 30, you guys can spread out here, go on this way. 30 to 33 children back in kids' ministry. This year we've grown tremendously, and it is such an honor to work with them. I'm beyond blessed. They are such amazing children with tremendous talent and love for Jesus, and they love you. Parents, they love you so much. I know sometimes at home it can feel frustrating, overwhelming, and exhausting, but I'm telling you, they speak highly of you, and you are doing a great job in raising them. So I just want to pray over them. So I don't know, Pastor Jesse, if you can come. We're just going to pray. We still have all of our little ones right now back in nursery and juniors, but we're going to pray a blessing over these kiddos as we go into the new year. Father God, we just thank you for each one here that's so special in your sight, God. Uh, you found David in the middle of nowhere, God, and, and you see these uh, young ones before you, God, filled with gifts and talents, but also love for you, God. And we pray that that would be nourished, that your Holy Spirit would continue to draw them into that place of relationship and intimacy with you, God, that they would grow in, in their faith and they would be ones that carry the torch, the fire of faith for you in the years to come, Lord Jesus. And Father, I pray for their families, that you would bless them, that you would give them wisdom to lead and guide them in every way. Uh, so, Father, we bless each family and each parent represented or guardian, Lord, uh, and give them the strength and the faith to follow you and to lead these into the love of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. You can head out that way. Praise the Lord. All right. So I'm going to leave baby Jesus right here. I'll get these off to the side. Awesome. Weren't they great? Yeah. Once I got it started. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to explain everything that went on back there, but you don't want to know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's just say we're going to talk about it on the way home. <laughs> no.
None of you married couples do that, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, it was great. It was fun. I uh, loved it. Uh, so, so we're going to be getting into uh, the message that I have for us today. And today's Christmas Eve, obviously, and just having a heart to experience God. And that's what we've been talking about uh, over the past month, really, the last few weeks, is experiencing God. Uh, before I jump into the message, I just want to pray real quick. Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you for every person that's here. I thank you for those that are watching online, God, that are here peering in and, and, and wanting to, to grow in their relationship with you or maybe just curious, God. And I pray that your Holy Spirit in this place would, would not only flood this sanctuary, but, God, that it would go beyond these brick walls and into the, the cameras and into the lives of those watching and listening this morning because I know you have something for us today. Your Holy Spirit is always at work, and no one is here by accident, but God, they're here because you're moving in their lives, and I believe that, God, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would touch them through the word that we go into this morning, because your word is living and active. It's not just like any other words in a book. It's the very oracles, the breath of God, and it leaps off the pages and into our heart and transforms us. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus, and I pray that for us today. Pray for your anointing for me in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, I'm away in. I wasn't going to preach this, but I'm away in. I was, I was thinking how, how time was split at the birth of Jesus. You ever think about that? Like there was, was before, and then there was Jesus, and now we're moving forward in this direction. Because I heard something on the radio. It said Jesus coming in the manger, the, the gift of Jesus was an eternal gift that cannot be taken away. And it was a gift to humanity when, when they were in darkness and, and had no Savior and had no way to, to know God and walk with God. And here comes God himself, Jesus, born in the flesh. And it was a gift from God to humanity. And it was a gift that could never be undone or never taken back. Therefore, time will always be going forward from the birth of Jesus. It's an eternal gift. And as I sat there driving in this morning and I heard that on the radio and, you know, tears are falling down my eyes and because of his gift for me, for you, for humanity, wouldn't we want to experience that God? Wouldn't we want to experience that God? So that's what we've been talking about over the past three weeks is uh, the Christmas experience. The Christmas experience. Why we've been talking about how we can position ourselves to experience Christ. Take Christmas, for example. For most of us, we experience the Christmas season because we position ourselves to experience the Christmas season, right? Whether it's decorating our house or putting up the Christmas tree or baking Christmas goodies or shopping for loved ones, the Christmas season starts when we decide to position ourselves to experience it. And I know this because some of you start in the beginning of November, right? You know who you are. You start Christmas when you decide to start it, when you decide to position yourself to experience it. You put your decorations out, you get your trees out, you put them all over Facebook, and you spread your cheer. So it's only logical that in order for us to experience not Christmas, but Christ, Jesus Christ, we will need to position ourselves to experience him. So how can we position ourselves to experience Christ? How can we experience, position ourselves to experience Christ? And we spent the last three weeks uh, talking about just that. The three ways that we can experience Christ, or three ways we can position ourselves to experience Christ. And if you remember, and I'm going to do a quick recap, well, one was surrender. Surrender. The other was sacrifice. Sacrifice positions us to experience God. And then the third one we talked about was worship. There it is. Worship. Right? We position ourselves to experience Christ through surrender. Complete surrender requires us to surrender our will, surrender our life, and surrender control. That's what complete surrender is. 
right? We can say we surrender, but if we're not surrendering ourselves in these three areas, we're actually keeping some for ourselves, and that's not really complete surrender, is it? But in order to, to give ourselves to complete surrender, we need the Holy Spirit's help to do it, right? Surrender doesn't come natural to the human heart. But when Jesus ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father, he promised to send someone he called the advocate, our helper, the Holy Spirit. He's saying, listen, guys, <laughs> you're going to experience me and God. You're going to experience God like you never have before, but it's going to take surrender, sacrifice, and worship. But I'm going to, I'm going to give you someone that's going to help you get there. Because trust me, you're not going to be able to do it on your own. And he says, it's imperative that I go. I can't stay with you guys because if I stay here, the Holy Spirit won't come and fill the heart of every person who turns to God and give him the help to experience my presence in their lives and the life that I've always had for them. So he gives us the advocate, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's activity in your life is to do what you can not do on your own. Aren't you thankful for the Holy Spirit now? Right? And that surrender that the Holy Spirit helps us do, that surrender to, uh, to Christ is for us to live the life that we were created to live. If you think about surrender, now when I was a little kid playing, uh, you know, cops and robbers, the last thing I wanted to do was surrender. <laughs> surrender is a bad thing. And we often think of surrender as a negative thing, as, as a bad thing. But one of the things I wrote down in my notes here is, you can't walk on water without God. If you're someone that just wants to live your life for you and just get what you can out of this world, you can do that. But you're never going to experience the life that God has always had for you. See, you weren't created to simply go to a nine-to-five, make money, go home, raise kids, don't raise kids, whatever it might be, and die at 70, and that's it. You see, God has uniquely created you to live a life of impact, to live a life that is divine, to live a life that uh, has kingdom uh, has kingdom. Uh, building properties to it. And I said that simply because I couldn't think of anything else to go with that. <laughs> but God has given you the things to, to have an eternal impact on everyone around you, to make a difference for God and to bring his kingdom from heaven to here on earth, right? Those are the gifts and the talents God's given you. But you cannot walk them out without God. And the Holy Spirit comes and he, he brings us into these places of sacri surrender, sacrifice, and worship to experience him, to have him uh, allow, uh, for us to allow him to give us the life that he's always had for us, but we need him in it. And I'm telling you, if you've been walking without God, if you haven't positioned yourself to not only experience him, but has it, have his life flow through you, then you're missing out. You're just going through the motions. And I promise you, whatever fun you might be having is going to end. Or maybe it's already ended. And you're wondering what life is all about. Well, God wants you to walk on water. But it's going to take him to be a part of it. And it's going to take surrender on our part. And the Holy Spirit is, is here. He's moving. He's active. And that's his job is to really position us and to get us and to empower us with the power that we don't have, but he does, to surrender our lives to him and allow the life of Christ to flow through us. So we need to surrender to position ourselves to experience God. Then there was sacrifice we talked about. Sacrifice is voluntarily choosing to live for God every day and follow his ways. Even when it's not easy. even when it's not easy. See, I can voluntarily choose to live for God every day until it's not easy, and then I do my thing. <laughs> but sacrifice means to do it even when it's not easy. It's this type of sacrifice that literally is choosing God's presence over what this world can offer you or what you can get for yourself. 
So you want to talk about one of the ways you can position yourself to experience Christ? It's sacrifice. Sacrifice. Voluntary sacrifice is costly. But that's what makes it beautiful. It's priceless. It's real. It's devotion at all costs. And it produces something that you cannot get without voluntary sacrifice. And that's intimacy with God. You see, you were created, and, and, and intimacy is, 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 sometimes in this world we've made it, we've, we've kind of perverted it, but intimacy is being exposed, giving our all, opening up every area of our heart and our life and just giving someone our all. That's what intimacy is. That's what marriage is supposed to be, and it comes with commitment, right? But that's what, what intimacy is all about is this is who I am. I want you to know me f- top to bottom every area of my heart, every chamber that's dark and I want to hide, I want you to know it. That's the type of intimacy that God wants you to have with him. And we can't get there without sacrifice. Intimacy with God is real, deep, meaningful relationship with God. And finally, we looked at worship. How do we position ourselves to experience Christ? Worship. You see, when we really encounter God, we can't help but worship him. The knowledge and the understanding of who God is and what he's done motivates us to pour forth praise and thanksgiving. In other words, worship. Right? True worship is felt inwardly and then expressed through our actions. So whether in moments of worship uh, like this morning, I hope this morning as we sang and we praised and we gave thanks to Jesus, it was a moment of worship for you. It was understanding who God is, how far above us he is, and yet he still loves us and wants to be intimately involved in our lives. And how God could have left us to our destitute state that was far from God, yet God made a way for us to have real relationship with a real and living God through Jesus Christ. And when we come in here and we see that God and we focus on that God, praise begins to flow from our heart and begin to thank him. And we begin to really worship him. Right? True worship is felt inwardly, then expressed through our actions. And those create moments of worship But there's also the kind of worship where we live a life of worship by yielding our hearts, minds, hands, thoughts, and attitudes to God's will and his ways, right? Where we live on purpose, for a purpose, every day. And it's to worship God with my life. When I go to tell someone, maybe my coworker, or maybe my family member, and I want to cut them, and I want to hurt them because I was hurt in some way. And yet God says, whoa, 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 what are you doing? You see, that's yielding. That's holding your tongue, saying, I'm not going to say that. Instead, I'm going to say something kind. Instead, I'm going to say something uplifting. Instead, I'm going to say something encouraging. You see, that's yielding to the will of God. In the Holy Spirit in your life. And that's living uh, on purpose for a purpose. And when we begin to do that in every area of our life, whether it's our work, our, our play, our, 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 uh, you know, our finances, our family, whatever it might be, when we begin to live on purpose for a purpose, and that's him and him alone, we begin to worship him with our lives. And it positions us in the presence of Jesus. But we don't live a life of worship because we feel like it. Right? How many, how many feel like not saying what you really want to say? <laughs> None of you are ever probably going to feel like it. And it kind of bleeds over into every area of our life. We don't live a life of worship because we feel like it. We live a life of worship because of who he is. He's bigger than me. He's greater than me. 
He's doing something in me that I, that I can't even begin to comprehend, but it's for him and it's for his glory. And when you begin to do it, not because you feel like it, but because, he, it, because it's, it's, it's for him. That's true worship. That's worship. That's a life of worship before the Lord. And it's these three things that position you to, to experience Christ and his presence. But today I want to talk about something a little different. Not about us positioning ourselves to experience God. Today I want to talk about how it was God who first positioned himself to experience us. Let's start in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. And the Apostle John, he writes this, being inspired by the Holy Spirit. He says, we love, why? Because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us. And when God first loved you, it wasn't because you were lovable. It wasn't because you were deserving in any way. In fact, if we go to Romans 5, 8, and I want us to look at this, it reads, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, while we were yet still far from God, yet while we were still so broken, wanting nothing to do with God, born in darkness. Now that born in darkness means to be without God. Did you know you were born without God? And yet he still sacrificed for us. He still gave up his heavenly throne in the Trinity to come and dwell with humanity. He still chose to, to live a sinless life and yet take the punishment we deserved. Even though while we were still unlovable, undeniably unlovable, he still sacrificed for us. He loved us first. You see, from the, the time of Adam and Eve, mankind has been born in darkness. Born in darkness, right? Born without God. And it all started with the fall or the sin of Adam and Eve, right? Many of us have heard about the apple that they ate from the tree that they weren't supposed to eat from, right? It's kind of a, a tale most of us have heard, whether, even, whether through Sunday school or even outside of the church, right? You see, up until that point where Adam and Eve ate the apple, mankind was one with God in our spirit, Right? And eating that apple changed everything. Now, it wasn't necessarily the apple's fault. Because if you boil, boil it all down, it wasn't something that was in the apple. It was something in the heart of Adam and Eve. They chose their own way over God's. Think about that for a moment. What separated them from God was choosing their own way over God's. I had to think about that for a moment. Because I still tend to do that. But it was this choice they made to, to choose their own way over God's that severed the relationship with God that they were created for. And in that moment, sin entered the heart of humanity. In that moment, sin entered the, the human heart and it created a separation between God and man and they were no longer one in spirit. It severed the relationship that God had created them to live in with him. Right? And the question arises, well, then why did God, God give Adam and Eve a choice? Well, it's because love is a choice, isn't it? To voluntarily choose something over something else. Not being forced to. Not because you have to. Because I choose to. And since then, the world has been full of injustice. From that moment that Adam and Eve ate that apple and chose their own way and sin entered the human heart, uh, the world has been full of injustice and unrighteousness, tainting even the best of people. 
because it's found in every human heart. And from that moment, the heart of man was forever broken with sin. But at the same time that Adam and Eve ate that apple and chose their own way, at the same time that injustice and unrighteousness was released into the world because of Adam and Eve's sin, God began to prophesy of a coming Messiah, the promise of the Christ that would destroy the power of sin and restore peace between God and man. Come on. Immediately after, God kind of breaks into the scene, and uh, you can go to Genesis 3, and you can read more about it on your own if you'd like, but in Genesis 3.15, he says, and this is God speaking, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. Now, that word he is singular, meaning there is one coming. There is one coming. He will crush your head, and he will strike, and you will strike or bruise his heel. In other words, God is saying, Satan... There is one coming that will ultimately destroy you and the power that you hold over this world. But this isn't the only prophecy about a coming Messiah, right? From Genesis 3.15 and on, God reveals his plan of a coming Messiah that would be God himself, and yet he be fully man. How does that work? I don't know. It's a good thing I'm not God because I couldn't figure it out. But he would be fully God, and yet he would be fully man, and that he would redeem humanity. And what do we mean by redeem humanity? He would fully satisfy the consequences of the sin that Adam and Eve brought into our lives and come to rule over the nations in complete righteousness and justice. Prophetic scriptures like Isaiah 7 that have been dated to be around 740 B.C., we talked about that, right? B.C., before Christ. Isaiah 7, 14 reads, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. And behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Moses prophesied in November, uh, Numbers, not November, Numbers 24, verse 17. He says, I see him, but not now. Right? Moses was brought into this revelatory realm, and, and he could see the Christ. I see him, but not now. Behold him, but he's not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Or how about in Micah 5, 2? Where the shepherd prophet says, But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the class of Judah, or the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Or in Isaiah 9, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You see, from the fall of Adam and Eve, mankind has walked in darkness. But it was in the heart of God all along that he would first position himself to touch our lives. That he would be the first to, to break into our existence, our realm, our lives, our darkness. And reveal himself, right? That he would first break into the darkness of our lives, our world, to position himself though, so that we could experience God. In fact, it was that first Christmas morning, right? And we can get our worship team up here. It was that first Christmas morning that Jesus positioned himself for us to experience him, right? Right? Being born in a manger, being fully God yet fully man, 
experiencing the frailty of humanity, becoming one of us to be God with us, to ultimately be the one who saves us. Jesus. You see, Christmas really isn't about decorations, trees, cookies, or even our good nature around Christmas time. It's not about the traditions of dinners, parties, and gift giving. It's not even about spending Christmas with your family, even though those things are great and they're good and we love to do them. It's about John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. See, it was Jesus who first surrendered. It was Jesus who first sacrificed to position himself for us to experience him, to to experience God. And like the shepherds and the wise men and millions of others since then, to be honest, we position ourselves to worship the one who broke into our darkness to be with us. And that is Emmanuel, God with us. You might be in darkness. Even today. But I'm here to tell you, God loved humanity so much that he sacrificed, he surrendered in order to position himself so that you could touch the life of Christ. Let's stand. Thank you, Jesus. This Christmas, I wanted you to enjoy the the Christmas season, if you can. But this Christmas, let us position ourselves to experience him. Amen. There's a lot of great things at Christmas time for some of us, but there's also for others maybe bad memories maybe brokenness maybe you're not someone that really enjoys Christmas all that much but one thing I do know is that for all of us whatever Christmas means to you prior to this there's an opportunity to experience a God who loves us let's bow our heads Father, I thank you. I thank you that you did send your son the willingness to sacrifice, to surrender, to give your only son. And I thank Jesus for his willingness to put his hand up and say, I'll go. I'll surrender the the magnificence, the glory, to go and become fully man forever. There's no going back. And Jesus said, I'll go. God, I want to be with them so badly. I want to love them. I want to know them. I want them to know who we are, God. I want them to be one with us, Lord just as it was always meant to be. God, and I'll go. I'll give up everything. 
to go, to be born in a lowly manger, to become fully man, to surrender my life to you, God, to, to live without sin and yet be the sacrifice for sin so that my sacrifice could bring them into relationship with me. Today's our opportunity to position ourselves to experience Jesus. And Father, I pray as we leave this place, Lord, that there'd be a fresh anointing. God, there's people in this place that are longing to be closer to you. And if that's in your heart this morning with eyes bowed, I, I'd, I'd ask you just to get your hand up. Not because I have to see it, because it's an acknowledgement before God that God, I, I need more of you in my life. I need more of your presence. I need to surrender. I need to sacrifice. I need to worship. And God, I pray that you would hear the cries of their heart, to know you, to position themselves, to experience you in a greater way. And God, I pray that you would release your Holy Spirit now into their lives and into their hearts. That this would be a moment, not only here in this sanctuary, but those watching online. This would be a God moment, a Holy Spirit moment, where the Spirit of God fills us, anoints us, to do the very thing that we can't do on our own. And that's position us to experience you in such a way that the life of Christ flows through us. And we live a life that really matters for an eternity. So come, Holy Spirit. Hear the cries of our heart. Let this Christmas be the Christmas that we turn and experience you in a greater way, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Lord. God, we thank you. We thank you that we get to celebrate you on Christmas. Help us not make it about anything else but you. And before we leave this place, I don't know everyone here, I don't know what you walked in with, whether you're close to God or far from God. But I do know many of you are going to get gifts tonight or tomorrow morning, and maybe some of you won't get any gifts. But those of you that are far from God, I want to give you a gift today before you leave. And that's the gift of salvation. That's the gift of eternal life. That's the gift of saying yes to the invitation to know God and to walk with God and walk with Him forever. And it's real simple to receive this gift. All you got to do is say yes and apply it to your life by asking God for forgiveness, for asking him to fill you with his Holy Spirit and ask him to empower you to live the life that he's always created you to live by following him. And if that's you this morning, and if you're online and you're like, man, I came in and I'm far from God or I don't even know God or I've never accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I didn't even know what that meant. There's a gift for you today and I want you to say yes to it if that's you. And if you can do that, I'm just going to ask you to get your hand up and say, that's me this morning. I need Jesus. If you're online, you can get your hand up as well. God sees it. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. Father, forgive me my sins. I've tried everything but you. God, wash me clean from what I've done and who I am. And fill me with your Holy Spirit. God, you said if I, if I cry out to you and I ask for forgiveness, that you'll cleanse me and bring me into relationship with you. And you're doing that today. Today we're one. Today my life is in the hands of God. Today I'm a believer, a follower of Jesus. 
and I'm going to follow you all of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, if you prayed that prayer, I promise you, God has heard the sincerity of your heart. God's cleansed you. God's washed you clean. God's brought you into the family of God. And you can leave confidently knowing that God is one with you. Go to his word. Run to him. Because you're going to begin to hear God speak into your life and lead you in the life that he has for you. Amen. Let's give God a shout of praise this morning. Jesus, we celebrate you. We have our, our Christmas Eve service tonight. Uh, our candlelight service at 5 o'clock. So come on out with your family if you can. We'd love to see you there. Uh, it's going to be a short, sweet service. Just celebrating Jesus tonight uh, with a candlelight service. Uh, but until next week, remember, you only have one life to live. Live it for Jesus. And you'll never, ever be disappointed. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you need prayer, come on up. I'd love to pray with you and our prayer team. We'll lay hands on you and stand with you. But until then, God bless and glory to God. Come down, King of heaven, come now. Let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? You are strong to save. In your mighty name, King of heaven, come.